I'd like to start this video with a scenario. It is Sunday night and you are finishing that physics assignment that's due tomorrow. You've been working on it all week, but you're finally at the last part. Every question builds on what came beforehand and at the end, on part Z, you have to establish that left-hand side equals right-hand side. That these variables are related to each other in this exact way. And you're so close. The integral's there and everything's of the right form, but the proportionality is wrong. The integral multiplies a factor of two instead of a one half what it's supposed to be. What do you do? I think a lot of people would get into that situation and conclude, it's probably a really small mistake. I'm sure I multiplied when I should have divided. And I would go back through it, but this is seven pages long. It's getting late and it's due tomorrow. I think a lot of us sometimes we'll submit the assignment. What if you weren't allowed to? What if you weren't allowed to submit problems that didn't have perfect solutions? In that scenario, we're kind of just compromising, communicating to our professor that we understand it to communicating to our professor that we mostly understand it, which depending on the context, we may be okay with that. But a couple circumstances where I think that requirement should be self-imposed, that it be perfect, would be like if you're a teacher or a researcher where you're responsible for someone else understanding it. Now a research project for a PhD usually encompasses a multitude of smaller projects and smaller problems that you have to solve. And I have been stuck on this one small problem of my research project for three years. Three years I've been trying to resolve an issue. I've been trying to get a specific constraint that needs to be satisfied in order to trust how I'm doing this calculation, it still isn't satisfied three years later. And for this video, I have an idea that I'm pretty optimistic about. I've had a number of ideas in the last three years that didn't really get me anywhere. Uh, but I'm either gonna walk away victorious or it'll just be an honest attempt at trying to fix this problem. And who knows, maybe I'll walk away with my tail tucked between my legs. But something's happened in this video. Now my research is primarily concerned with understanding proton structure. And I do this by calculating these things called form factors of the energy momentum tensor. What is that? Which I know is a bit of a mouthful, but pretty loosely speaking, form factors keep quantitative tabs on how the target that you're hitting, you're scattering your beam off of, how its physical properties like charge density, magnetic moments, mass distributions, maybe pressure, how that information is spread out differently from if it were a point particle. So they contain that structural information. So now I can actually talk about what my problem is. So what you're seeing is the matrix element of the energy momentum tensor, particle coming in with four momentum P, leaving with momentum uh, P prime, and that is parameterized in terms of two form factors called the A and the D term that are functions of the form momentum transfer squared, uh, delta squared or T, depending on what you want to call it. And what I'm really interested in is the D term, this thing that we think has to do with pressure distribution inside of the proton. But in order to trust that we're calculating it properly, we have to test our calculation against a sanity check, which is the normalization of the A term. At zero momentum transfer, A has to equal one. It's a fundamental constraint. It can't budge. It's more or less a statement that in the rest frame at zero momentum transfer, the energy of the target is its mass times c squared, in the same sense that the total angular momentum of a particle at rest is its spin. So this is the thing that for three years I haven't gotten to be satisfied, this constraint. Uh, but recently I've done some changes of how I'm organizing this calculation, which has given me a, a number of different ideas of things to try. And ultimately at the end of the day to calculate this matrix element, it corresponds to calculating a bunch of Feynman diagrams, which looks something like this. Okay, and there's about a dozen, let's say, Feynman diagrams. And you have to add every single one of them up and then see if the A term normalization condition is satisfied. And so that's been one of the frustrating things about this calculation is it seems like I can only check if I'm doing it right at the end. And this is a 60 page calculation that I've done at least four or five times over. So naturally over the years, I've tried exploring a bunch of options of where the problem child could be in this calculation. Uh, am I calculating a specific Feynman diagram wrong? Are there ones that I'm missing? Should I be taking the constraint very literally? Is it, is it renormalization scheme dependent? Can A of zero equal one 
ish. Like we're all perturbative people here. Like we're all friends, right? Now that one is actually to be taken very literally. I think the issue might just lie in combinatorics, as embarrassing as that is to admit, and that's what I'm gonna be exploring in this video. If you haven't seen combinatorics yet, it's basically just the math that tells you the number of ways you can do something. So as a quick example, if you think of me standing at the edge of a cliff, and uh, it's a narrow cliff, Here's my car, so if I make it back to my car, I make it home safe. That's the rule of the game. But I'm gonna introduce some random motion into my walking that's all equally likely. And if I walk backwards, I make it to my car. But if I walk right, forward, or to the left, I fall off the cliff. And I ask you, what's more probable in this scenario? That I fall off the cliff, or that I make it back to my car? I think our intuition tells us what the answer is, but to be a little bit more quantitative, the probability that I fall, again, since each direction is equally likely, the probability that I move forward equals the probability of me moving right, left, and downward. But the probability of me falling is then the sum of the probabilities of me going forward plus right plus left and since we know that these are all equally likely, we can write this as just three times the probability of moving upward. Okay, and uh, for me making it back to my car, there's only one option. It's the probability that I move backwards. And let's suppose it takes one step to get to my car backwards. Since these are all the same likelihood, this is the same as the probability of me moving forward. So me falling to my death is three times more likely. That's a bad deal. But this paints the picture because I really don't want to get into the details of how to calculate Feynman diagrams and the combinatoric. Too much is going to get lost. It's not going to be making it that much more complicated is not going to make it that much more insightful. So, so Andrew falling off a cliff will have to do. Uh, in this analogy though, what I'm calculating, the Feynman diagram is this P up, okay? And what I'm not sure of, or, or what I think I'm starting to convince myself, is that I've incorrectly related it to P-fall. In other words, I'm really suspicious that I've done the Feynman diagram equivalent of forgetting that the direction left exists, which in this example would change the 3 to a 2, and so the multiplicative factor, the proportionality would be wrong. Uh, the combinatorics would be wrong. And so I have pretty good reason to expect that this is what happens for one of the Feynman diagrams that I think is supposed to cancel another one, but I'm really suspicious of how it's gonna fix that problem, how changing the combinatorics will resolve this issue without ruining everything that's working well with the other Feynman diagrams I've calculated. So now if you let me talk about what the problem really is, I'll come up with an example that's not exactly my research, but it's exactly in the same spirit. I just don't wanna be scooped, so I can't put the exact problem online. But here's an example Feynman diagram of a two to two process, two particles coming in, two coming out, operator being inserted into the diagram at point X, and this is some kind of like hybrid representation. We got Z1 and Z2 being the locations of the vertices uh, that are being integrated over. And so if I wanted to calculate this Feynman diagram, I'd have to also account for all of the equivalent ways of, of arriving at it. And so if I wanted to do that, uh, I can start with this matrix element where I have the P P4, P3, um, and I'm going to use 1, 2, and X as shorthand notations for the fields as functions of Z1, Z2, and X because there's a lot of them. Uh, there's four for each vertex, right? So there's 2, 2, 2, 2, X, X, 1, 1, 1, 1, P2, P1. And one way that you can form the, the Wick contractions is I could say, and let's, let's do the combinatorics or let's find the issue that I've been having. So if I want to contract P1 with Z1, I have four copies of Z1 to do that with. So that's a combinatoric factor of four. Uh, P2 to Z1, I have three remaining options. We do the same thing for P4 and Z2, P3 and Z2. And my issue was actually what to do with the combinatorics of X when there's not just one of them. Like I, I've been saying, how many ways can I can I, uh, can I contract an X with two 5Z2s? And originally, I would have told you that there's two ways to do that. 
and then there would be two ways of doing x to z1, sorry, two, and then there'd be one remaining way of connecting z1 to z2. One. I don't think that this is the right way to do it anymore, and I convinced myself this by temporarily treating the operator insertion as being non-local. So if I instead treat it as this kind of diagram, and this is gonna look a little weird at first, it's still P1, P2, P3, P4. But now this is at point X and Y. So I'm inserting a 5X times 5Y instead of 5X squared. The rules of, of calculating the Feynman diagrams, I'd also have to eventually calculate this one. X and Y, where they're, where they're switched, where you switch X and Y. P3, P4. And then once you take the limit that x equals y, then these two diagrams are the exact same thing and you get an additional factor of two from the combinatorics. Just looking at this diagram here would give you the exact same combinatorics that we just did together. However, accounting for this other diagram that would certainly be there if it were non-local and you can treat local as a local limit of non-local, then there's a whole factor of two that I've been missing. So I'm pretty sure that this additional thing, this additional factor of two should be there. I just need to better understand why that doesn't seem to screw things up for the other Feynman diagrams. I mean, I'll get to work whenever this guy decides I can have my chair back. And I can smell the smoke, but it's no cigar. I feel so close, yet I feel so far, and I'm getting sick and tired of these false alarms. I didn't actually put whiskey in my coffee. That was a joke, okay? It's 1.30 p.m. <laughs> not, not two. When I was an undergrad, one of my professors, who's an experimental nuclear physicist, talked about how people in that field think like five-year-olds because they want to study the structure of a particle, so they scatter a beam off of it and study the pieces that it breaks into, like the Legos that make a Lego house or something. And today, I saw how a theorist, meaning myself, can also think like a five-year-old, in that it seems that the resolution to the combinatoric problem is tinker toys. I had to think about breaking the diagram up in terms of rods and gears with variable numbers of sites to attach them to and say, how many ways can I do this where I still get the same house, so to speak, at the end of the day? This is so much more clear than doing this non-local Feynman diagram stuff. It still worked, but this way was much simpler and it just required that I think like a five-year-old. So anyways, I'm gonna bring this to my advisor tomorrow, but that very well might be a wrap on this part of the project. One week later. Okay, it is actually a week later now. The meeting last week ended up being more about logistics since in the next few months I'll be visiting like a handful of other national labs. So the research project meeting is actually going to be today. I'm about to go to it. Uh, but a week has gone by. I haven't been just sitting on my hands. I would go so far as to say I've convinced myself that I was in fact counting wrong. The, the tinker toy way of thinking about it was actually very convincing. <laughs> Um, and so what I've been doing for the remainder of the week is I know I'm going to go to a different theory in the future and I'm going to be scratching my head saying, what was the issue with the combinatorics last time? So I wanted to come up with a more general procedure that I can just follow to count how many ways I can generate certain types of Feynman diagrams with arbitrary types of operators being inserted uh, across different topologies, different theories, and guarantee that I'm not gonna run into the problem that I had this time. So those are the two things that I'm gonna bring to my advisor today. I'm gonna say, here's why I'm convinced that the counting was wrong, and here's what I've changed so that now I'm convinced it won't happen again. And then he's gonna probably point out flaws in both of those steps, and then I'm just gonna drop out. Okay, let's get into the conference room where we'll have our meeting. Man, I have spent a lot of time in grad school at this specific spot, because a lot of people know this, but I wasn't accepted my first semester. Uh, and seeing as I'm maybe just now learning how to count, I can understand why a little bit better. But because I wasn't accepted, I was here as non-degree seeking, so I didn't have an office. So I just came to this conference room whenever it was open to get my schoolwork done. But now that I'm a full-fledged grad student, of course, I don't even use the office I have, and I just work from home and no one sees me. 
But in any case, uh, in just a couple minutes, I'll start the long conversation with my advisor to see if I really have solved this problem or not, or if it's just another false alarm. After about three hours of drawing pictures, talking about indistinguishable propagators and distinguishable sites on vertices, all that good stuff, one of the big conclusions that I didn't really think to account for is that um, I'm Matt Damon and not Ben Affleck. The other thing we learned is that I solved the problem. I solved the problem of the normalization of the A term and that feels so freaking good to finally be able to say after three years. So needless to say, I need to go home and change my pants because there's chalk, there's chalk on my pants. <sighs> and I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of at a loss for words right now. I don't know that I've done a good job explaining why all of this uh, normalization stuff is important, but I've done the entire calculation basically already and for the last three years, more or less, I just couldn't tell if I could trust it. And I couldn't trust it, or actually I knew I couldn't trust it because the A term wasn't satisfied. So somehow I have 60 pages of calculation that I know I can't trust, but I don't know why. And so now that I know what the issue was and I've solved it, it's not like now I can do the calculation. Now I can just trust that it's correct, which is such a good feeling. It's like crossing off two steps at once. Um, and to be honest, I know it's a combinatorics issue was what it was. And undoubtedly, that is a combinatorics problem that has been solved before by someone. Someone probably just solved it. Someone did it in German. Someone did it in terms of rearranging balls in buckets. And I just couldn't be bothered to try to figure out how they're asking their problem. And so I, you know, it's nice to know that if it were up to you to solve the problem, it still gets done as opposed to if it were up to someone else, you can understand their explanation. Like those are, those are like different not the same quality of understanding something. So it's it's good to prove that to yourself every once in a while, even though it was a bit of an embarrassing lesson to learn. So I think that's a wrap for this video. Uh, this is a pretty cool one to be able to share, I think. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Actually, there's one more thing I have to do to make sure that this never happens again. Now we're gaming.